Welcome to the subject of soil science and plant nutrition. This is lecture 7 on soil and plant macronutrients, phosphorus and potassium. This lecture was developed by Dr. Nikki Cooley and Dr. Doug Rao. This subject is delivered as part of the agricultural degree which is offered at North Melbourne Institute of TAFE, an education establishment based in Australia. Please visit our website www.nmit.edu.au for further details about the educational products that we offer. My name is Dr Nikki Cooley. In this lecture today we are going to look at the macronutrients, phosphorus and potassium. With nitrogen, they make up the group of the primary macronutrients. We are going to look at their function in plants, their deficiency symptoms, look carefully at their cycles, as this will help with management, and finish each component by looking at some examples of commercial fertilizers. Plants harvest the energy from sunlight and turn this energy into chemical energy. One of the forms of this chemical energy is ATP and ADP. ADP stands for adenosine diphosphate and ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. These compounds are routinely used for energy exchange throughout the plant and is a very important component of the plant's functionality. Phosphorus is also involved in rubisco, phosphorylation, the production of phospholipid membranes. Phosphorus typically is found at a concentration in a plant of 0.2 to 0.4 percent when the plant's dry matter is measured. The visual image on the slide shows a phospholipid membrane. These membranes are incredibly useful as they are able to filter out and only allow certain compounds through them. This is a very important functionality in plants. Most Australian soils are generally low in total phosphorus. Many soils around the world are also low in total phosphorus. Soil phosphorus content is usually about 200 mg per kilogram or less than 0.2% of the total P in soils. Of that, between 4 and 40 mg per kilogram is available to plants. Most crops require about 15 mg per kilogram of available P. This is referred to sometimes as the Orson P. You need this 15 mg per kilogram in order to optimise your yield outcome. Roughly nine times the required phosphorus needs to be added to overcome the tendencies of soils to fix P into unavailable forms. Or seven to 11 times, depending on the phosphorus buffering index, PBI. Phosphorus deficiency symptoms generally appear as poor growth, smaller leaves, dark discoloration, and sometimes you may see red to blue lines in the leaves. In the, this is a picture of a grapevine illustrating phosphorus deficiency. As all nutrient deficiencies, often the symptoms can be variety specific. Therefore, if you suspect a deficiency, it is advisable to get a quantitative test to confirm your suspicions. The image on the slide shows a visual representation of all the components in the phosphorus cycle. In this cycle, phosphorus is converted between mineralized and non-mineralized versions of the compound. It is the mineralized version that plants can take up. I will start with an overview of this cycle and then break it down into components. Phosphorus can exist in the soil as phosphate, HPO4, or hydrogen, dihydrogen orthophosphate, H2PO4. It can also exist as sorbed phosphorus, organic phosphorus, or in phosphorus minerals. 
Phosphate is the only form that plants can take up, yet in most agricultural soils, as stated before, there is less than one mg per litre. <clears throat> this represents less than 1% of the total soil phosphorus. Organic phosphorus, which is phosphorus bound up in organic matter, has been found to represent between 25 and 65% of the total phosphorus in the surface soils. With mineral phosphorus, such as calcium phosphate and sorbed phosphates, representing the remainder. This was <coughs> discussed by Bradley in 1984. Organic phosphorus decreases quickly with soil depth, paralleling decreases in organic matter. The processes that control the amount of available phosphorus in the soil are plant uptake, sorption, desorption, mineralization, immobilization, precipitation, dissolution and erosion. As soils evolved, rock was weathered down. Phosphate comes from weathered rock composed of apatite and floral apatite and it is used infrequently due to the low solubility of these two minerals, especially at high pH. Organic producers frequently use the raw form of unprocessed phosphate as a nutrient source, but at very high rates the pulverised into small pieces as possible due to its low availability of phosphorus concentration and solubility. Typically, phosphoric acids are now used rather than the rock uh, phosphates to produce commercial phosphate fertilisers as this contains less contaminants. The breakdown product of, from the rock is PO4. So let us look at the involvement of plant and animal in the phosphorus cycle. Let's start with plant uptake. Despite low concentrations of phosphate in the soil solution, Plants can take up substantial amounts of phosphate due to the phosphate deabsorption and dissolution followed by phosphate diffusion to the plant root. This was showed by Forth and Ellis in 1997. By taking up large amounts of phosphorus, a strong diffusion gradient is created and this moves phosphorus towards the plant root <clears throat> at much higher rates than water is moving via the process of transpiration. Phosphorus uptake for selected agricultural crops ranges from about 24 to 72 kilograms of phosphorus per hectare per year, although these amounts are dependent on yield. Commercial phosphorus fertilisers have historically been expressed as the oxide form, that's P205, rather than the elemental form, P. Therefore, phosphorus values are still expressed as P205. Using the ratio of their molecular weights, percent P205 can be converted to percent P by multiplying by 0 0.44. To estimate P205 uptake for a specific field, one can divide actual yield in the yield, <coughs> actual yield by estimates of yield and then multiply this result by the P205 uptake. This allows a general estimate estimization of your fertilizer and you can base your fertilizer recommendations on the content that your plant has taken up. You can also get your plant material measured for its phosphate removal and therefore work out how much fertilizer you should replace. P mineralization is the process where organic P becomes converted to phosphate as organic, decompose, as organic phosphate decomposes and immobilization is the process where available P becomes tied up in microorganism cells. Mineralization occurs most rapidly when the carbon to P ratio is less than 200 to 1 and immobilization occurs when the ratio is greater than 300 to 1 as shown by Havelin et al. in 1999. For comparison purposes, the C to P ratio for beef, beef cattle manure is about 100 to 1, suggesting that decomposing manure should mineralise or release phosphorus rather than immobilise phosphorus. Mineralisation and immobilisation of phosphorus are affected by temperature, 
moisture, aeration and pH. And these were similar to the ways nitrogen mineralization and immobilization was affected. This is because they are dependent upon micro microbial processes. When phosphorus is in solution in the soil, it can be available as HPO4 or H2PO4. All the processes that, can, that is involved in either converting this and making it available to plants or making it unavailable to plants are highlighted on the screen. They include precipitation, absorption, fixation, uptake, immobilization and finally leaching. Leaching was not shown on the phosphorus cycle it's significantly, as it rarely occurs in many soils. One 20-year study in Winscombe, US, found that phosphorus from commercial fertilizers had not moved more than 5 centimeters below the plow layer, and the phosphorus from manure application had moved less than 20 centimeters below the plow layer by Mayer et al. in 2001. The higher movement of phosphorus associated with the mule is likely due to the effects that organic materials have on sorption. <clears throat> in sandy soils, commercial fertilizers applications have been found to increase available phosphorus concentrations by up to three feet below the surface, but have had no effect on phosphorus at 4.5 feet below the surface. A three-year study in Wyoming in the US on a sandy clay loam found that very high irrigation rates leached phosphorus to approximately 4.5 feet. Therefore, phosphorus leaching is probably only a concern on some coarse sandy soils that are frequently flood irrigated, as in the Murray-Darling Basin. These may have long-term high-rate manure applications to overcome these problems. Mineral surface P can be subject to either fixation or deabsorption. Soil pH can significantly impact on phosphate retention. Aluminium phosphates and iron phosphates are the predominant phosphate minerals in soils with pH levels below about 6.5 as shown in 1999 by Havelin et al. The solubilities of these minerals decrease at lower pH, directly opposite of the solution for the calcium phosphates. Therefore, phosphate is the most available around 6.5 because at lower pH levels, phosphate drops off. Therefore, in order to properly manage your phosphate levels, you need to be aware of your soil pH and manage it within those criteria. You are now able to form a budget of all the inputs and the outputs of available phosphorus. These should include the gains, that can be fertiliser, manure, deabsorption, mineralisation and dissolution, while the losses to your system are plant uptake, absorption, immobilisation, precipitation and finally erosion. Leaching is not mentioned because if you remember this does not tend to occur. Like nitrogen, there are a range of commercial phosphorus fertilizers available to the farmer. The single superphosphates contain 9% phosphate, 11% sulfate, and 19% calcium. The advantages of these, of these fertilizers are that they give you phosphorus, sulfate, and calcium, all of which are important plant nutrients. The disadvantages are that the phosphorus content tends to be on the low side and it's less cost effective than a phosphorus fertilizer. The triple superphosphates contain the same compounds as the single superphosphates but in different ratios. 21% phosphorus, 1% sulfur and 15% calcium. The monoammonium phosphates, or MAP, commonly used in agriculture in Australia, contain 22% phosphorus, 10% nitrogen, and 2% sulphate. It has the advantage as it has nitrogen, an important element as well. 
The disadvantages are that the nitrogen concentration is low and the nitrogen in this form can be somewhat volatile. Other phosphorus fertilisers include diammonium phosphate or DAP, also used commonly in Australia. This contains 20% phosphorus, 18% nitrogen and 2% sulphur. It is a good source of nitrogen when both elements are deficient, although the nitrogen tends to be in low concentrations and the nitrogen in this form is somewhat volatile. Organic phosphorus fertilisers are such products as bone meal. The advantages are that they are okay for organic farming accreditation and may help build up your micro community as well. The disadvantage is the cost of transport and of delivering these fertilisers on the field as special infrastructure is required. The third fertiliser discussed on this slide is that of lime or calcium carbonate. This has the advantage that it neutralises acidity and it migrates phosphorus fixation with soluble iron and aluminium. Now look at, let us look at the primary macronutrient potassium. Potassium has a range of functions in plants. It's most important in osmotic adjustment. Here we see a picture of stomata. These stomata have guard cells. Potassium is fundamental in the opening and closing mechanism of guard cells. When guard cells are open, transpiration can occur and water loss occurs. But carbon dioxide enters the plants, allowing photosynthesis. When stomata are closed, no photosynthesis and no loss of water. The image on the slide is of a sodium-potassium pump in cell membranes. This is another important component as it enables cell transport. You will see that ATP and NADD are involved in this process too. The total potassium in the soils is re reasonably abundant and it ranges from 0.5 to 4%. Unfortunately, it's mostly unavailable to plants on the clay colloid exchange mechanism. 1% of the total, that's 50 to 100 mg per kilogram, is available. It deabsorbs from the, col the colloids into solution along a diffusion gradient. The preferred level of potassium in agricultural soils is 0.5. milli equivalents per 100 gram or 195 mg per kilogram. Potassium deficiency symptoms tend to appear as necrotic leaf margins or leaf wilting. Here is a second example of potassium deficiency symptoms. As you can see there is some difference between this image and the grapevine image in the slide previously. Potassium deficiency is considered as one of the easier deficiencies to identify. But <clears throat> chemical testing of the leaves would, would confirm this analysis. Potassium is found in the soil in the form of K+. It is stored on clay colonoids, cation exchange. It's easily leached in sandy soils, low pH soils and high nitrate soils. It can also erode and it can also be subject to weathering. The image on the slide gives you an overview of the potassium cycle. There are two main forms of potash, uh, potassium fertilizers on the market. Murate of potash is perhaps the most common. This contains a high concentration of potassium at 50%. It also contains 46% chlorine. The advantages of this fertilizer is the high potassium content, that it's readily dissolvable, and that you have additional chloride ions that can be used. The disadvantage is that additional chloride ions <coughs> is relatively high, so if you have a saline soil, this fertilizer is not appropriate. The second fertilizer 
is dipot dipotassium phosphates. This contains 41% potassium and 18% sulphur. The advantage is that it's a lower salt index than, you, than the potash. The disadvantage is that your potassium is lower than the potash. This brings us to the conclusion of the lecture on the primary macronutrients phosphorus and potassium. I hope that you now understand the functionality and the role that both of these nutrients play in plants. As you will see from their functionality, their requirement is significant. We have covered both the cycles of phosphorus and potassium in the soils. As for nitrogen, it is important to understand these cycles so that you can manage your nutrients partially by managing their cycles. Also note the similarities and the differences to the nitrogen cycles. And finally, we have had a look at some of the commercial fertilizers on the market for both these uh, nutrients. This brings us to the end of this lecture.